What defines a fuel cell? A fuel cell is a device that converts a fuel, in our case hydrogen, directly to electricity without combusting it or burning it. So can you take virtually any type of fuel and, and separate the hydrogen out? Well, there's a process that's called reforming where you can take uh, fuels that contain hydrogen, like methane, natural gas, uh, coal gas, that contain hydrogen and separate the hydrogen, and then the hydrogen is used in the fuel cell. And so how difficult is that process, and does it depend on the type of fuel source that you're using? The creation of hydrogen is a, an industrial process that's practiced every day. It, you can do it chemically uh, from natural gas, or you can even do it from water through electrolysis, which is actually running a fuel cell backwards. Hmm. I guess the thing that people have to get their head around is that hydrogen doesn't just exist in the ground. You can't go mining for hydrogen. You need to not create it, but well, I guess in a sense you're sort of separating it. Correct. So that process is expensive then, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily that expensive. Uh, it's more expensive than, say, pumping oil out of the ground for the cost of the well and not paying for the oil and then um, using that as a fuel directly. Uh, but it's not so expensive. Hydrogen uh, cost has been reduced maybe by a factor of two over the last 10 years uh, in terms of being able to be distributed for uh, our use in fuel cells. What about the size of fuel cells? You know, how, how practical are they in terms of, you know, we see them in the buses. Mm -hmm. What about putting them in cars? How difficult is it to get them down to that size? Well, um, let's say prior to 2001, uh, the fuel cell in cars was intruding on the passenger space. In fact, the first fuel cell that was in a, uh, a van took up everything but the driver's seat uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, but now, the latest generation of fuel cell vehicles, the fuel cell does not intrude on the passenger space at all. The whole system doesn't intrude on the passenger space. So as far as the driver is concerned, they still have the same amount of space. The backseat passengers have the same amount of space. The trunk still has the same amount of space. How has the rise of the Tesla and the LEAF and other electric vehicles affected the future of fuel cell, te fuel cell technology, positive or, or negative or at all? From a technical standpoint, uh, very positively, because the electric drive technology that's used in a battery vehicle is exactly the same that's used in a fuel cell vehicle. Uh, from a political standpoint, it's been a little more mixed as uh, some people uh, see fuel cells versus electric vehicles instead of fuel cells and electric vehicles, and it really should be both. There's not, neither one of those solutions will solve the world's problem in terms of transportation. Um, Is it uh, that they have different applications? Uh, or are they just, they can coexist together? No, it's a, it's a matter, they can coexist together for sure. Longer range vehicles, typically you'd want a fuel cell vehicle because you can get better range by carrying hydrogen with you. What is the history of the fuel cell? Where did it start? Did it get its start in, in space? In no, history? actually the first fuel cell was uh, invented in the mid 1800s. Really, that England. far back? Yes. Um, what was the, what was the, how did that happen? Um, it was a science experiment, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, Grove basically took uh, platinum electrodes and used the fuel and oxygen and created electricity. So was it a eureka moment or was it more of an accident that this all happened? No, I, I think he had been working in, in gas uh, electrochemistry uh, and was just doing experiments. And yes, of course, it was a eureka moment. Uh, the interesting thing is throughout uh, maybe from, throughout the 1800s for sure, uh, a lot of the work that was done on fuel cells was people thinking about how to create uh, electricity from coal gas directly. It turns out that coal gas um, has a lot of hydrogen in it, and that's where it was coming from. But nobody really understood how a fuel cell works until the turn of the last century when Oswald kind of described it in more scientific terms. I think people think recently of the history of fuel cells, say in the 1900s, as coming from the space program, which was happened in about the 1960s. Uh, GE invented pen fuel cells uh, for the Gemini space program in the U.S. So. It's, it's been around a long time, uh, but 
in terms of real technological development for use uh, and practical applications, I'd say probably since 1960s. What about the durability of fuel cells? How do they cope in extreme conditions, whether it's uh, high humidity mm -hmm. or uh, low temperatures? Can they survive in these really sort of extreme ends of the, of the temper temperature? Sure, scale? our products operate between minus 40 and plus 50 C. So that covers most of the planet, except maybe northern Canada in the winter time. Um, but they're designed to be that robust? Yeah, and humidity is from 0% to 100%. Hmm. So I think the biggest change in fuel cell technology, say, in the last five years is those kind of issues around performance. So, so will it last in this environment? Does it have enough durability to be practical? Uh, can you start it in freezing temperatures? Have really been solved. And now it's a, a very large amount of work going on in terms of making those solutions to those technical problems less expensive to implement. I think there's been a lot of progress. I think the fact of the matter is the automotive companies think that um, 2015, plus or minus, is when they'll be launching their first fleets of uh, commercial fuel cell vehicles. Uh, but the transition to a very large uh, amount of uh, transportation system being in fuel cells will be much longer than that. There's nothing standing in the way except our ability to make it cost effective for people to implement. It's, it's up to us. We can be masters of our own fate. Um, in the interim to getting there, um, we're doing a lot of scientific work. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. Um, in the last five years, the cost of our fuel cells have come down by about a factor of five. Uh, so we're doing a pretty good job. How much do you see people be motivated by the green side of fuel cells versus the cost at this point in this economy? I mean, which one no, are they? Yeah, not, not so on? much. They're focusing on, on, on cost or value. Sure, uh, people I think want to be green, and people might pay a little bit of a premium to be green, but they won't pay double to be green. Some people will, of course, but most people won't. So these are three generations of our liquid cooled stack. Um, cooled by what sort of a liquid? Liquid cooled water. Water, yeah. okay. Or ethylene glycol, like in your car radiator. Yep. This is the first generation, interestingly, called AP1. Um, this is a one kilowatt unit, very high efficiency, uh, originally designed for use in the home in Japan. Um, we Which is where folks in Japan do have these, is yes, to power their homes strictly with right, a fuel cell. There's 700 homes in Japan with a ballard fuel cell in them. Where is the fuel source coming into? And so the, the fuel in here uh, comes in here where it says fuel in, in this nozzle. Okay. okay. And the air comes in here. And the fuel that goes to recirculate comes out here and the air goes out there. So literally somebody might have one of these in their home in Japan and be off the grid. No, it, in Japan it's used, um, it's grid powered and what it's used for is uh, to balance hot water heating and electricity. I see. So you use... Um, so it's working with the grid, in a sense. It's working with the grid. So all uh, a homes, all their hot water and their first kilowatt of electricity will come from their fuel cell unit. Okay. But yeah. is it possible that someone could have one of these and then be off the grid sure. entirely? Yeah, if it was big enough. These are our air-cooled uh, stacks, generations. Uh, this is the very first generation of uh, air-cooled um, product. It was called the Nexa. And any university that has a fuel cell program probably owns Something like one this. of these. Okay. There are many people in the fuel cell industry that learned about fuel cells using this device. Okay. Uh, this is our current generation of air-cooled stack that's used for backup power. And in this case, the cooling uh, is done by the air that's also the reactant that makes the electricity. This product here, which was uh, is the Mark 9 SSL, that's used in material handling applications. So this is a 15 kilowatt product. Now, does the cost go up dramatically between the two? Actually, the the air cooled stack costs more than this. Really, even though it's putting out less power. Correct. And the reason the reason is that technology is less efficient use of materials. However, the, the source, the fuel fuel source. Correct. The the thing is, this system requires other pieces, uh, other devices like pumps and um, 
recirculation blowers and more electronics and okay. other things so that that system, the air-cooled system, is much simpler to implement in terms of a, a fuel cell system. This is the fuel cell, the Mark 902, that's in the current generation of uh, Ford Focuses and Daimler A-Class vehicles that's on the road. How heavy is something like this? Uh, this is about uh, 300 kilos. Okay, I was yeah. going to ask you to lift yeah. it, but I won't do that. <laughs> okay. This is based on the same technology this is uh, a bus engine um, from the fleet of buses that was used in Europe, a 30 bus fleet that's, there's still six buses operating in Hamburg. And how does this compare to the ones that are being used in the buses at Whistler? Uh, this is an older uh, technology. So bigger? Uh, slightly bigger, yeah. Different, okay. A little bit different. Uh, doesn't last as long as the ones in Whistler uh, and uh, costs a lot more than the ones in Whistler.